Hello and welcome to the second and last lecture for midterm week. So in this lecture we're going to start building up some of the tools that we're going to use to help solve the combinatorics problems similar to the problems I introduced in the first lecture, well in lecture 18. So when counting we often use a state, we often quantify a statement with and, and, or, or. So let's examine what and and or do when I'm counting things. So when counting and is similar to and for propositions or the set intersection for sets. And and can be used to combine possibilities. And by combining possibilities, I mean usually via multiplication, pretty much exclusively multiplication. Uh, so from here, let's look at an example. What are the number of ways to select an, one element from the set dogs, comma, lawyers and one element from the set ABC? So in this case, there's two ways to pick an element from the first set, either dogs or lawyers, and there's three ways to pick elements from here. So combining these together, I know that there's going to be two times three, which is equal to six ways to pick an element from the first set and an element for the second set. So we've seen this before. So if I go back to the example one when I was rolling the dice, uh, six-sided dice to build a four-digit number, uh, I roll the first dice to build the first number, and then I roll the second dice to build the second number, and then I roll the third dice, etc. So we've seen this before. This is just quantifying it a bit more precisely. Now let's look at or. So or is a bit different. It's an odd duck. So let's examine it now. When counting, or is different from the or that I used for propositions or the set union that I used for sets. So explicitly when counting, I use exclusive or or zor. So I talked about this a bit when I introduced the idea of logical or, uh, and this is explicitly the or that we use in English. Soup or salad, one or the other, not both. So if I use this symbol here, to denote exclusive or, and this is a common symbol that's used, uh, the logic table for exclusive or would be given by this statement here. So the only difference between exclusive or and or is that if P is true and Q is true, exclusive or will be false because it has to be one or the other, not both. So now let's look at an example here. What are the number of ways to select one element from this set or one element from this set? So here, let's just look at each one of these sets individually. There's two ways to select an element from the first set, and there's three ways to select an element from the second set. Since these sets are disjoint, since they don't have anything in common, there's three plus two is equal to five possible outcomes from picking an element from the first set or an element from the second set. So again, we've seen this before. So when I did the D and D problem, the last example on uh, lecture 18, I split the possible party compositions into five disjoint cases. I computed how many possibilities existed for each one of those cases, and then I simply add them up. So this is a formalization of that idea. And now let's talk about something new, exponentiation. So let's revisit example one to drive a general principle. So example one was the dice example. Here we're playing a dice game that involves rolling the d6. We form four digit numbers by rolling four dice. So the question was how many four digit numbers were possible in this game? So the answer to this was six to the fourth. And this was the answer because there's six possibilities for each roll and there were four dice rolls. So this idea holds in general. So theorem, I'm just going to name it ordered with replacement. You, so again, you don't have to refer to this theorem via this name. You can basically just use the theorem by saying, hey, yeah, this is obviously true. Uh, the number of possible outcomes of n ordered events with m possible outcomes for each one of the events is m to the n. So let's see an example here. How many ways can I draw 42 random cards out of a deck of 52 distinct cards if I replace and shuffle the deck after each draw? So here I want to know how many possible ways can I pull out these cards, and I care about the order. Further, the cards are replaced and the deck is shuffled so that each time I'm actually pulling a true random card out of the deck. 
So how would I solve this? Well, solution. I can notice that this is an ordered with replacement problem, right? I pull a card, I put it back, shuffle it up, I pull another card, and the order in which I pull the cards matters. So there's going to be 52, 52 because that's the number of possible cards I could pull at any given point, to the 42nd, 42nd because that's the number of times I keep pulling a card. So this is a really big number. So sometimes in your homework, you'll end up with a really big number like this. And the calculators available to you might not be able to compute all of the digits in that number. So it is okay to write big numbers like this in this form rather than writing it out as uh, this number here. So whenever I want to compute the total number of outcomes of a ordered with replacement type problem, I use exponentiation similar to how I solved this problem here or the previous problem over here. Now let's introduce a new tool to our toolbox, factorial. So for any n in w, so this is the numbers 0, 1, 2, 3, da, 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 we're going to define n factorial pronounced n to be this piecewise function. So it's equal to one if n is zero, otherwise it's equal to n times n minus one factorial. So note, this is a recursive definition. n factorial, as part of the definition, calls n, factor n minus one factorial. So if I were to try to code a program to evaluate this function as it's defined here, I would need to use recursion. So let's just give an example of that. To compute four factorial, I write, 4 factorial, well, that's going to be 4 times 4 minus 1 factorial or 4 times 3 factorial. And now I don't know what 3 factorial is. So I plug that in. 3 factorial will be 3 times 2 factorial, just plugging it in here again. And from here, I don't know what 2 factorial is. So from there, I plug 2 factorial back in, and that gives me 2 factorial is equal to 2 times 1 factorial. And again, I don't know what one factorial is. So I plug that in. And in the case where it's one factorial, I get one times one minus one or one times zero factorial. And now I don't know what zero factorial is. So plug that back in. And when I plug in zero, this just gives me one. And now I've kind of terminated this recursive argument here. So in this case, four factorial is four times three times two times one. This last one, you can kind of drop off if you wish. So this is the factorial that you probably have seen before. So where can this be used for combinatorics type problems? Recall previously that oftentimes I needed to know the number of ways that I can rearrange in items. So this appeared in many of the examples that I introduced in lecture 18. Further, we'd found that the number of ways to rearrange four items was four times three times two times one. Uh, I did that for the DND &D problem. So to be explicit, this is where I did it, that process previously. So you can notice that the number of ways to rearrange four items is four factorial, and that looks promising. Like if this holds in general, that's a nice shortcut, right? So does this hold in general? Yes, this holds in general. So the number of ways to rearrange in items is in factorial. The argument that you would use to prove this is basically start with a list of n items. The number of ways that you can select the first item is n. The number of ways you can select the next ones, n minus 1. And you can do that until you get down to 1. You can also use an inductive argument if you want to be a bit more formal. Nevertheless, we're not going to prove this. Let's start using it. How many ways can I reorder the str string Q-W-E-R-T-Y? So here I have the letters Q, W, E, R, T, and Y, six letters, and I want to rearrange them in various orders. So how do I solve this? Well, I first note there's six distinct letters. Thus, via the theorem before, there's going to be six factorial ways that I could possibly rearrange them. So that's all I have to do here. So now I can ask, how many ways can I reorder the string ECE108? So in this case, I have letters E, C, E, 108. So there's six letters, but two of them are repeated. So we have a little bit of extra stuff we have to potentially contend with here. So just using what we've done previously, 
I know there's six symbols, so we might think that there are six factorial ways to rearrange them. But again, there are two E's. So if I swap the two E's, I get the same string, right? It doesn't matter which E goes where. So I now need to divide this six factorial by the number of ways that I can rearrange the letters without changing the string. And since the order of the E's doesn't change the string, and since there's two factorial ways to rearrange these two E's, there will be six factorial divided by two, which is 360's, ways to rearrange the string ECE108. So in general, if I say added another E to this, how would that change the problem? So if I added an E right here, how would this change it? Well, now I'd have seven symbols, so there would be seven factorial ways to rearrange it, but then I'd have three symbols that are all E's, those are the same symbols, so I would have to divide by the number of ways I can rearrange those E's, which would be three factorial. Further, if multiple letters were repeated, then I also might have to divide by a few other re possible rearrangements. And you'll see this quantified when you read example 14. So now we are not just restricted to reordering elements of a string to form new strings. We can ask more complex questions and we can use our combinatoric stuff to answer these questions. What are the number of bijections from the set S containing the elements 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 to itself? Well, what do I know about bijective functions? So here, if I was talking about a bijective function from a set S to S, I could draw my kind of standard diagram where I have my five elements here and my five elements over here. So here, if I want to build a bijection between these two sets, it has to be the case that for every element here, there is a unique element over here that it's mapped to. So in doing this, when I'm choosing what to map, say, the first element one to, I have five options. So there's five cho chooses, so there's five choices here. When choosing what this goes to, I have four options. So there's four choices in what I can map it to. And now there's only three left. So there's three choices here, two choices here, and one choice for this last one. So I apologize for the order not being the same here. But from here, you can see that when building a bijection, I need to map this to something and map this to something and map this to something, etc. So from that argument, you can see that it should be 5 factorial. Another way of coming to this same conclusion is as follows. A bijection from a set to itself is simply a rearrangement of the elements in the set. Right? I'm just taking the elements of the set and I'm mapping them to something else in the set and that's just rearranging them. Thus, since this is just a rearrangement of these elements and the number of ways to rearrange five elements is five factorial, there will be five factorial or 125 possible bijections from S to S. So this just goes to show that these counting arguments aren't just strictly about counting rearrangements of things or the number of ways that I could pick something. I can also apply them to find the number of functions that have certain properties. So the methods that we're developing are pretty powerful outside of the kind of toy game models, outside of these little toy examples that I've been giving. Okay, so I want you to read pages 68 through 70. So again, there are multiple examples. Explicitly, there's examples 6 through 14 that I want you to read. Uh, six, seven, and eight involve the pigeonhole principle. I introduced this earlier, so I'm not going to get into the details there, but I do highly suggest reading those proofs to see how you can use pigeonhole principle to get, say, upper bounds or lower bounds on the number of objects required for certain things to be true. Uh, and then examples nine and 10 cover uh, exponentiation examples, so it's good to see them. And then finally, examples 11 through 14 cover some examples where you can use uh, factorial to solve the problem. So kind of a word of caution, these two tools that I have defined in this lecture will be used extensively going forward 
So make sure you understand what exponentiation and factorial do and where you can and can't apply them. So it's one of those cases where if you uh, get it down pat now and put in the work now to understand it, it'll make your life easier going down the line. Okay, so we have a meme. Not sure if it's a factorial or he's just really excited to get the answer. Okay, okay, so going forward in the next couple of lectures, we will define permutations and combinations. These will give us new tools that we can use to apply to the examples that I introduced in lecture 18. And these tools will make our lives a little bit easier by allowing us to solve more classes of combinatorics problems without going through all of the tedious details of those counting arguments. Okay, so best of luck on your midterm, and I will talk to you later.